Right, so I'm a little bit late to this, but that's just because I've been really busy recently. So I haven't really had the time to uh, make this video, but I've been wanting to make this video for a while. Uh, and yeah, so I finally get the chance to. Uh, so first of all, I just want to say uh, I am not really a Mr. Enter fan. Uh, I don't usually watch his content. Um, like for one, like his content, he just, well, his content's not really for me. But I don't really know why he calls himself the mysterious Mr. Enter, since he's not really mysterious. Because if you look on Google and you type up the name Mr. Enter's real name, it literally comes up with his real name with literally a picture of him right there. So I think he needs to rebrand himself on that. But his uh, Turning Red review apparently has been getting a lot of controversy. Apparently Twitter has been blowing up about uh, how bad it is and how he brought up a political subject out of nowhere. Um, so I want to at least bring this up. Uh, I did also watch Turning Red as well, so I have at least an idea about what he's going to be talking about. And just to give my own brief thoughts on Turning Red, uh, I thought it was alright. You know, it wasn't great, it wasn't amazing. It kind of reminded me a lot of uh, Michael J. Fox's Teen Wolf. Uh, just with a younger girl who's going through puberty. But uh, in all of no, so I thought it was at least a pretty enjoyable watch. Probably wouldn't watch it again. But, you know, I thought it was at least a good one-time thing. Uh, so, yeah, come, come, my dear followers. And we shall see what's been making Twitter blow from this mysterious enter. So I watched Turning Red recently, the latest Pixar film. What took me so long to see this one? Well, I was actually avoiding it for a couple of reasons. Most notably, the trailer. Like, I think that even people who like this movie will agree that the trailer is really, really bad. Okay, I would agree with that, that the trailer did look a bit, you know, it wasn't really the greatest trailer in the world, and it did kind of look a bit, you know, cheesy and whatnot. But we can't really judge a book by its cover, so, you know, again, I watched a movie and, you know, I was pleasantly surprised, it was quite sweet, it wasn't anything amazing, but, you know. With a super in-your-face attitude. And it didn't really make any arguments of how a transformation into a red panda could actually carry a movie. But it kind of did, though. Like, the trailer itself, I mean, the trailer did illustrate that this was a puberty thing. You know, that this is a character who was going through pu puberty and they were using a, the red panda as sort of a surreal way in order to uh, illustrate that. Um, that was very clear in the trailer, you know, even though it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't the greatest trailer in the world, it did still kind of show that. It seemed like an incredibly light, simple premise. And the other reason that I didn't want to watch Turning Red at first was because if I did, I knew I'd have to talk about it. That doesn't really seem very professional for a movie reviewer to say. With the chaos and the drama this movie has caused, it's really tempting to just go one way or the other. Praise it for being shocking and daring and tackling new ground. I've never heard anyone describe the movie as shocking, daring, and tearing new ground. Even by the trailer, it's, it doesn't come across like that. I've never actually heard anyone, any reviewer from this movie say, oh, it's shocking and daring and, da and bringing new ground. No one has said that, so wh why are you bringing it up? It's really cementing itself with the Ghostbusters effect. It's not a movie, it's a political argument. What? What? No, it's not! It's a little girl going through puberty. <laughs> it's not a political argument. That's not a political statement. It's not a political argument. And comparing it to the Ghostbusters movie... No! <laughs> no! It's not! There's no similarities between them whatsoever, apart from the fact that the main character is a girl. That's the only similarity between the 2016 Ghostbusters movie and this movie, is that the main character is a girl. It's not a political statement. What the fuck? Why bring that up? It's a fairly simple movie, despite all the drama, and yet there's a ton to talk about. Yes, there is a lot to talk about. That's why my review is under 12 minutes long. I'm going to start with what held me back from actually enjoying the movie, and that is May's mother, Ming. I'm gonna be dead straight with you. I hated this character so much that I thought I would have to stop watching the movie. Meng is a helicopter parent, the type who controls every little thing about their child's life and are super panicked that a slight deviation from their plan will harm their child. So they create this self-fulfilling prophecy where they hurt their child so much more than the rest of the world could. Okay, so what he's doing here right here is he's bringing up uh, Ming's mother being a bit of an un being a bit of a control freak. Uh, the thing is though, a lot of parents are like this because you know whenever, like for an example. My mama doesn't like me using the word cunt. 
Uh, she hates it when I use that word. In fact, she never, she didn't, she, she didn't bring me up to use that word. I only really use it just because it's just something that, you know, I feel like I can do. And again, freedom of speech, I do feel like I have the right to use that word. I can do it. Um, but she doesn't like me using it. She didn't bring me up like that. So anytime she actually does hear me use it, um, she freaks out. She's like, oh my God, you shouldn't have said that. You know, I didn't bring you up to be like that. That's nothing new. That's something that a parent does do. Um, I know that's probably not really like the best example ever, but like the thing about being an over-controlled parent, this is something that a lot of parents do do. They they are a bit overprotected, a bit paranoid. Uh, I mean, this is coming from someone who's not a parent, but I have looked after uh, kids with special needs before uh, and also with other mental problems. Um, but... Yeah. Every time that Ming was on screen, I was angry. The two most infamous bits you've probably heard of. When she finds drawings of May's crush and drives her down to the store to show the boy in them what May did. And the other time is when she came down to school unprompted to try and give May menstrual pads without any self-awareness that she was doing it in front of her whole class. Again, this is nothing out of the unordinary. Like, parents do do this stuff. Parents do do this. So it's not out of the unordinary. I mean, yeah, it's worth to bring it up and everything, but again, it's not out of the unordinary for parents to do this. There's also a third moment that really struck me, and that's when May goes to Tyler's party, and Ming was so blind to any possible reasons that May might rebel, especially after the first two incidents, that she basically stops May from seeing her friends. That's something that a parent does do. That's something that a parent will do and does do. And need I remind you that this is a film about puberty, in which the problem is solved with twerking. No, the problem is not solved by twerking. The problem is solved by understanding the child. Is it realistic to take a child's drawing of a crush, drag her down to a convenience store, and confront the person in said drawing in a store full of people? Especially if you are under the delusion that these things actually happened. Yes. Yes, they would do that. Say for an example that they see something that's a bit out of the ordinary for them and they don't fully understand. It's like, she could also make the assumption that, you know, he's being a pedophile in this scene. He's like, you know, he's like uh, 17 years old, she's just like 12 years old. He can make the assumption that, you know, he's having like this, putting all these emotions in her head. This is something that's not out of the ordinary. This is something that a parent would do. Is it really realistic to try and directly give menstrual pads to someone and not leave them with a nurse at school? Yes! Again, this is not out of the ordinary. Ming's behavior is too over the top. Actually, no, it's not. That's actually the problem. The problem is that it's realistic. It's something that could feasibly happen if you were one of the worst, most brain-dead people on Earth. It's not like, say, Doofenshmirtz, who also had a hard upbringing. So hard that neither of his parents showed up for his actual birth. That was meant to be a joke. It was solely made to be funny. You cannot compare a Disney movie about a child going through puberty to a birth scene that was clearly a joke. If you want to talk about realism, we need to talk about Encanto. This was a Disney film also about generational trauma, which seems to be the theme of the season. Mirabel's grandmother was guilty of pretty much the same things, being overly controlling, trying to keep her family in the perfect boxes that she imagined for them. Of course, Encanto didn't make me want to smash my computer because it was subtle. El Canto was a lot of things, but it was not subtle. All right, you can say a lot of things about El Canto, but it was not subtle. It was good, I liked it, but it was not subtle. The same message, you, you, you describe it as having the same message as uh, turning red, but you describe it as subtle. The thing is, it was not subtle. It was very much in your face. This movie really feels like it was made for the TikTok generation. The TikTok generation? What's the TikTok generation? I've never heard of that saying before. The movie also overestimates how common cell phone use was among middle schoolers at the time. It wasn't until the mid to late 2000s when cell phones became a common thing in middle schools. Uh, no. People were using mobile phones around that time. I know that because I was at school around that time. I was, I mean, like, in 2002, I was, like, around five years old. Uh, so I wasn't really, you know in high school or anything I was still developing myself but um from what I remember cell phone users were actually quite still quite common on um 
in 2002. Not to mention that this movie is also a animated movie and also a movie. So even if it isn't completely inaccurate, it still does... It doesn't really matter too much. By 2002, boy bands were on the way out. That is literally the year that Justin Timberlake went solo, effectively ending the craze for a decade. Uh, no. Okay, have you ever heard of the term directionist? Those are girls who like, well, the fan base around One Direction, all right? And in fact, around the time, there were even, like, more boy bands coming out. There was, like, of course, One Direction, but also, like, people like JLS and, like, Smackwing of Others, all right? The, the boy bands were not out. In fact, they're still relevant even today. <laughs> Do you not understand this? This film takes place less than a year after the September 11th terrorist attacks. I bring this up because it radically altered the culture of the time, in ways that make this movie feel exceptionally ignorant of the time. Even though, literally, the only reason I can comprehend that this movie is set explicitly in 2002 is because the director grew up in that exact year. Yes, this film takes place in Canada, not the United States, but all over the Western world. Canada, America, the UK, much of Europe, people were paranoid because 9-11 wasn't the only terror attack that had happened. It was the major theme of the decade. I mean, I can understand not wanting everyone to be so fearful, as that goes against the tone that the movie is trying to establish. But then you have very awkward moments if you actually were there and you do actually remember the time period. Okay, so this is the part of the review where... Everyone on Twitter has been going ballistic about the bit where he just brings out of nowhere and has no relevance whatsoever to a incident that happened in New York in 2001. Okay, so the problem with this isn't the fact that he's just bringing it up. The problem is it has no relevance to the movie itself. Uh, there's no reason why this needs to be brought up. It has no reason why this needs to be... Uh, acknowledged. Uh, so why are you making a political statement about a subject that has no relevance to what you're talking about apart from the time period this movie is set in? Not to mention that this is from a perspective from a 12 year old girl. Well yes, 9-11 definitely did affect other countries such as Canada, UK and so on. Th it mainly was a problem for adults. South Park made a brilliant episode called Osama Bin Laden Has Fardy Pants. And this was taking place a couple of months after the event. It perfectly shows about how the kids coped with it while how the adults coped with it. And I think this clip right here proves me right. Hey, look what the postman brought me. It's a big brown package from Afghanistan. Oh, that's nice. We sent the Afghani kids some dollars. They must have sent us something cool in return. We have some scissors to cut this open. Stanley, your mother's a little freaked out right now. Why don't you go play with your big brown package from Afghanistan outside? All right. Big brown package from Afghanistan! That right there is a perfect examination about how kids and adults coped with the 9-11 terrorist attack. Like... The moment with Ming, this strange adult standing outside of the school with a box. An adult that no one wants to account for, completely trying to obscure her appearance and getting attention of the kids in the school. In real world 2002, she wouldn't just be confronted by the school security guard, she would be tackled by the police and hauled in. No, because the, re the school have security so the police don't have to, so because the police will be dottering around somewhere else. So that's why we have security for school properties, because they would allegedly, if that does happen, remove, like escort them into another area so the police can handle it and then call up the police because the police will be somewhere else. They wouldn't be, they're not like every corner of the streets. All right, that's why they have security there. Like, here's the thing. If they picked 1999 or 2000 or literally any year that was not 2002, this movie setting would make a lot more sense. But it's not an issue with the movie. You said you had a ton to talk about, but yet you have f all you've really done is you've just bitched about the mother, which you clearly don't understand, and you've also brought up a political subject that has no relevance to the movie itself. I don't understand. Why are you... Why did you say that you have so much to talk about and yet you added absolutely nothing? 
Like, there's also May's father, Jin. He says, like, two words throughout the entire film, and then towards the end, he decides that he wants to be an actual character, out of nowhere. You do know there are silent people in reality, right? There are people like this in reality who don't really say a lot, and but they do sit down and listen. There are people like this in reality. Oh yeah, there's also the, the puberty thing. It is really underplayed and the controversy is blown mega out of proportion. Beyond the metaphor of May turning into a red panda, you're not going to get much besides menstrual pads. Like, you could watch this film and think that the only symptom of going through puberty for May is turning into a giant red panda. It's a surreal interpretation of it. A surreal interpretation of puberty interpreted by a red panda. And this is something that I'm getting really tired of happening, by the way. I don't know whether to call it shock advertisement or an offshoot of rainbow capitalism, where Disney and its stands say that everyone has to go see X, Y, and Z film and absolutely love it because it's so daring, so brave. I've never heard anyone call this movie so daring and brave. No one has actually said it's daring and brave. I've never heard it. You know, like how they add in a literal gay wink and a nudge, so they can claim that they're the first LGBT character in their film for the 20th time, in such a small role that they can remove it for international audiences. You want animation that's daring? This isn't an even animation that you're showing, it's live action! Watch Brace Face. No, I'm not kidding. That show actually had a period episode with things like menstrual cramps mentioned, which aired in 2001. That was more than 20 years ago. And if you're not keeping score, that happened before this movie even took place. No, I haven't seen that show, but from what you showed me right there, I hardly doubt that that show is daring. Hardly doubt it. I'm not going to give easy credit for things that have already been done and done better 20 years ago. Or more, in the case of Hey Arnold. But if you want to keep giving credit to a mega corporation that stole your values and is trying to sell them back to you, keep on praising every little scrap of things that they will keep removing for an international market. Because the only color that Disney and these other corporations care about is green. Right, so that review was awful. <laughs> it was a really bad review. Uh, for one, uh, it has definitely deserved all the dislikes it's got. Uh, for two, it actually just proves nothing. He said he had a ton to talk about, but he didn't really talk about anything. All he really did was he just complained about the mother, and also he brought up a political subject out of nowhere. Um, yeah, this review is pretty pretty bad and i think what also doesn't really do any favors for him was his twitter response his response on twitter yeah it wasn't really very good uh, he said something on the lines like oh good to know that i was a dick before but now it's i didn't get controversy over those shit but i got controversy over this it's like dude are you aware that you're a fucking dick are you aware of it? Because, like, no actual human being on the planet would actually say something like that. He also said something on lines like, oh, I don't really care about, you know, your opinions. You know, I've been hurt from lots, so I'm going to disable my comment sections. So you do care what people think, because obviously you're really hurt by it. Oh, my God. Um, but, yeah, like, you know, like I said before... I'm not a huge Mr. Enter fan, you know, I'm probably not the best, you know, I, I just wanted to cover this just because I felt like I had stuff to say about it. Um, I'll, I'll link some videos down in the description so you guys can go and check out better videos about this particular subject. But, yeah, you know, again, if, if you found some uh, quality from this review, you know, kudos to you. But, you know, I definitely didn't really think this was a particularly good video. All right. Anyway, um, what do you guys think of this review? Uh, did you like the review? Did you not like it? Uh, comment down below. Please subscribe. Hit the notification bell to be notified for more videos. Pardon me. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye-bye. <laughs>